Okay. Day four, class four. I'm so used to saying day instead of lesson <laughs> or class. All right, class four. Oh no, that's so sad. Look at this. Aw. I've been using it for three years, so it's gonna happen eventually. Um, all right, so, so our first class, we talked about the power of the truth. Truth is a person, and that person is? God. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, all right. Um, we said that, that we cannot set ourselves free. We need Jesus to set us free. And uh, we also talked about the difference between transformation and reformation. Does anybody remember the difference that was here for that class? Without looking it up, can you remember? No. <laughs> there, were, there are three, is what we do. three things. Reformation is what we do. Transformation is what God does. God does. Okay. Reformation is temporary. Mm -hmm. Transformation mm -hmm. is permanent. permanent. And reformation is from the outside, outside in. in. Transformation inside out. Very good. A little bit of a reminder. Okay. Um, and then we talked about knowing your enemy. And not that we need to spend a whole lot of time knowing who the enemy is, but we need to know how he operates so that we can protect ourselves, right? And the biggest thing we learned is that basically he's just really deceptive and he's subtle. And for every every lie that he tells, there's some kind of truth, and that's why you gotta be careful, because before you know it, you say, Oh, well that sounds about right just jump right in don't even realize that it's actually not um, we also learn that we give the lies power because we want to believe them we want to believe that we can sin without consequence we want to believe that we can make stupid decisions and have really good results uh, and so we give the lies their power we also learn that Satan is trying to do whatever he can to keep from being ineffective in, in growing the relationship with God Third, third lesson is about opening your eyes to deception, okay? Deception is all around us, and we probably don't realize how much around us it is. And so we talked about how we have to guard our hearts, we have to be careful, and we have to be very, very proactive and committed to consistent, determined living in our relationship with God. Otherwise, if we're passive, if we're letting life play out, we're going to fall into deception because it is all around us. We also talked about the fact that deception is always dangerous, destructive, and do you remember the third thing? It's a really loud car, isn't it? It's the curtain. It's the what? Oh, it's the curtain. That's why it's so loud. <laughs> that fan's been on for like an hour, and that's the first time that's happened. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. So it, a, a lot of what we talked about was um, the, the difference between um, asking what's wrong with something and asking what's right with something, and then the difference between feeling better and getting, getting, better. getting better, right? Because sometimes in order to get better, you kind of feel worse, and then you get better, all right? So uh, we, and Instagram gratification, all that stuff we talked about. So now we're looking at some really cool stuff. We're going to be using the board a lot, which is why it, it looks like some sort of game Maybe. over here, but it'll all come together in a really cool way. It'll be really fun. And if it's a little confusing in the world, that's okay because I can draw it out for you later if you can't keep up. The main thing is make sure you're understanding it. So if it's too overwhelming to try to take notes from the board, then that's okay. I'll give you a copy of my notes. Don't worry about it. Make sure you're actually understanding what we're talking about here. All right. So we're looking at seeing the progression. How do we get from deception to bondage? Deception is all around us. How come some people are around deception and they're fine, and some people are around deception and they immediately fall and fall and fall and fall and fall and fail? What makes the difference? Here's the first thing you need to understand. People never crumble in a day. You don't end up in bondage overnight. You're never going to wake up and find yourself completely out of control when the day before everything was going your way. It may, you may have felt that it was going your way, but it doesn't work that way. And so there's something wrong because you never, ever accidentally, suddenly end up out of control. There's always a progression. The problem is the progression starts so slowly and, and, and in such a subtle way, we don't realize it at first. And so we don't realize it till it's out of control. That's why we need to take a step back and, and 
look at how this actually happens if we're going to keep it from happening again, right? You've got to be alert. Now, the Bible is so full of warnings that if you, to, to be alert, to be careful, watch, be sober-minded, be vigilant, pay attention. And you know what we're really bad at? Paying attention to life. Paying attention to our choices. Paying attention to our inputs. We have got to make a shift in that and start caring more about our lives if we're going to avoid getting into trouble. Now, there's a couple of, well, first of all, let, let's just do a quick little walkthrough here. There's, a, there's four steps to this progression, and I'm going to write them up here so you guys don't have to be looking down in case you haven't memorized them yet. The, the progression of going from being around deception to actually being in bondage, it's four steps. The first step is what? This is question number one. Listen. First step is listen. What's the second step? Well. Third step. And the fourth step. I'm going to say fourth again. A B C D. Act. Act. All right. So. It starts with listening and ends with action. So now let's look at what this really is going to look like playing out. Now, um, as a sign of, well, I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Um, the, the, it always starts with listening. Now, in your workbook on question number three, there's an odd question, and now I want to see what you guys kind of got out of that. As a uh, as long as we live in this world, we cannot completely isolate ourselves so that we never hear any lies, right? That's what we talked about last time. There's deception all around us. You're never fully going to be able to avoid it. So the question becomes, what's the difference between hearing and listening? I put hearing as when you just hear the lie. Listening is when you listen and respond. Listening implies paying attention, engaging, and ultimately some sort of response. And that's the difference between, um, you know, you can be in a store and you can hear people talking all around you. Or you can be in a store and you can go up to somebody and you can actually listen to them and try to figure out what they're saying. Big difference, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a difference between hearing and listening. And we have to cultivate a, uh, a way of being able to be around deception without listening to or paying attention to deception. How do we do that? It has to do with what we talked about last time, which is immersing yourself in the Word of God. And when your priority is the Word of God, and you're thinking about the Word of God, and you're dwelling on the Word of God, and you're memorizing the Word of God, and you're familiar with the Word of God, then that's going to be what occupies your thoughts and your mind. So you're not really going to pay attention to the deception around you because it's not familiar stuff anyway. It would, it would require you being a little bit more intentional in the wrong way to catch it. And so the more you seek God and His Word and the truth of His Word, the less you're going to be caught listening to the lies. So it starts with listening. Um, this is why we got to be really careful about the inputs that are in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Again, that's so much of what we talked about last time in making decisions based on what's wrong with something versus what's right with something. Okay, Philippians 4, 8, and 9, uh, there's a, there was a list that you looked up. And, and it, I mean, brothers and sisters... Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, think about these things. I find it interesting that there's that many things. He doesn't just say what's true, does he? He also says a whole bunch of other things. It has to be all of these things. Because sometimes there's an element of truth, right? That's why we got it's more than just true. Is it right? Is it pure? There are things that are true that aren't pure. So should we be listening to those things? No. And so we got to run it through that whole list of things to make sure that what we're listening to, what we're paying attention to, is what God wants us to pay attention to. And this is vital. Listening seems like something very insignificant and small, but it is huge because it only takes one small step in the wrong direction for you to suddenly and quickly find yourself completely opposite direction where you want to go. A one degree shift, that's all it takes, okay? Um, is, are you guys familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba? Okay, I'll tell you about it. David, King David, you familiar with King David? Heard of David and Goliath? Mm -hmm. King David is the favorite of David and Goliath, but he just wasn't a 
king when he fought Goliath. Mm -hmm. David becomes king, and, uh, and, and I'm just going to kind of give you the rundown of the story. You can look it up later and read it on your own. But basically, uh, in, in the spring, every year, the kings would go to war. Kind of a weird tradition, but that's how it was. And, uh, and, and one spring, David decided to stay home. And he went for a walk on his rooftop, and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath on, uh, and wherever she lived or whatever from his palace, and he lusted after her. He, says he looked at her with, and, and he lingered and he lusted, so he sent for her. And she was married, and her husband was fighting the war. <laughs> and he slept with her, and she goes home, and then figure that how she must have felt. I mean, that's horrible. But she goes home, she finds out later she's pregnant, so she tells him. So David kind of panics, right? Um, as you would imagine. And so he's thinking, well, I need to get her husband home. If I get her husband home, then he, he can be with his wife and, and they'll think that and he'll think that it's his and everything will be just fine. And so he, he brings him home and the, the guy is so full of integrity, or her husband, so, so full of integrity. I mean, he was just incredible because he, he comes home and he doesn't go home to his wife. Why am I saying that's integrity? Because he felt bad. He said, all of my, my friends and my, my colleagues, and however you want to put it, they're all fighting the war. I should be with them. I don't deserve, because Keith David was like, I'm going to give you this commendation, and that's how I got it back. It's like, I don't deserve to be recognized, and, and I don't deserve to go home. I'm going to sleep out here on the street, because I don't deserve this. I should be out at, out at the front lines with them. And so that plan kind of backfired on David. And, um, and so plan B, unfortunately, David sent a letter to his commander of the army and said, I want you to take this guy and put him on the front lines knowing that putting him on the front lines would mean that he would be killed. And so he, even worse, gives it to the guy to deliver to the commanding officer when he gets there. I mean, can you imagine? The guy's oblivious. He's faithfully serving his king, and the king is doing all this to him. And so the, the, the command of the army puts him on the front lines, and he dies. And uh, did that solve David's problems? No. No, because that never, that would, no, no, no. But... David, as you can imagine, was racked with guilt. There's some psalms that he wrote during that time that, that show us that. Uh, but it took some time for God to get his attention. And actually, the way that God got his attention was by sending a prophet named Nathan to him. And Nathan told him a story. And he said, uh, he said, I want you to imagine there's this guy. He has all these sheep. And his, 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 he has a visitor. And he doesn't want to sacrifice one of his own sheep for dinner. So he takes this other guy's sheep. And it's the only sheep the guy has, but he takes it anyway. And he kills it to eat for dinner. And David is all upset. Who does this guy think he is? And he needs to be he needs to be punished for that. That is horrible. And he gets all emotionally invested in this story. And then he's like, tell me who it is. And Nathan says, it's you. Can you imagine how David would have felt? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, so clueless. Wait, what? Me? Mm -hmm. He said, you did this. You have all these wives and all these concubines, and you took what this one man had, the only thing that he had, and then you killed him. How is it that David, who's described as a man after God's own heart, who was this incredible king, who was following God from a very young age and known as a man of integrity from a very young age, how did he so suddenly go from that to being an adulterer and a murderer. How does that happen? Where was his first mistake? He wasn't after his wife. No, no, before that. Before he saw her, he made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Where were the kings supposed to be? Oh, he's supposed to went to war. And then he was supposed to have went to war. Mm -hmm. Was it a sin for him to stay home? Not necessarily, but he wasn't where he was supposed to be. This is the difference between what's wrong and what's right. What's wrong with staying home? Well, sometimes what's wrong with staying home is you get bored and you get restless. Mm -hmm. And then you start doing stuff you're not supposed to do. And then you got to start covering it up. And then it escalates and it gets out of control. And before you know it, you're in the same position David was. 
instead of asking what's wrong with staying home, maybe he could have said what's right with staying home. Well, maybe there's nothing right about staying home. Maybe I need to lead my army into war, and maybe I need to, to, to be a little bit outside my comfort zone. Even though I could take a break, I'm going to do it anyway because it's the right thing. And then he wouldn't have been there. He wouldn't have seen it. He wouldn't have gone down that road. One little step, one little choice that in and of itself may or may not have been sinful, but was simply a matter of what's okay and what's good and right versus what's what's wrong with it, what's right with it. And so there's a, a little little step, little decision of listening to, you know, who knows what he was telling himself, what he could have been listening to. He could have been listening to say, you know what, you deserve a break. Right? What's wrong with that? Sometimes that's all it takes. And and we're going to learn this as we go through the study. But one of the most dangerous lies that we start, I, I shouldn't say one of the most, the majority of the most dangerous lies that we believe start with the words you deserve. When you get focused on what you deserve and what you what your rights are, you get into dangerous territory very quickly because the focus is self. And anytime focus is self, everything gets distorted. And so that's probably what started, what started things for David. So um, there, there's this progression that takes place with just listening. That's all it takes, just listening. And the next thing you know, off to the races in a really bad way. Listening to a viewpoint that is contrary to God's word puts you on a slippery slope that leads to disobedience, which leads to physical and spiritual death. That's a quote from this lesson. There's a there's an there's another progression that's in Psalm one. And so if you have your Bibles out, go ahead and turn to Psalm one and let's walk through this real quick. I say walk and it's kind of you know, pun there. You already know the lesson. open up in the middle of your Bible, you're probably going to be in Psalms. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the page number, but if you open up pretty much in the middle, 1, blessed is the one. Now, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a negative here, so we're going to flip it around when we actually do it. But uh, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. I'm just going to stop with, with verse 1 right now. Now, the uh, the version that I'm going to use here is, is a little bit different, and so i just keep that open. But um, the... The original NIV is walk in the counsel of the wicked. This is walk in step with the wicked. Walk in the counsel of the wicked is a little more accurate. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to draw some stuff out here. We're going to walk through it. All right. The first thing we see here is, you know what? Let me use, would it be easier to read a, well, I'm just going to use blue anyway. It's going to get really confusing. Whatever. Sorry. Walk in the counsel of the wicked is the original version. Yeah. The actual translation. All right. So we're going to look at this. So uh, walk. What does walk mean? Walk means the way that you live your life. Okay? So you're blessed if you don't do these things. So we're going to look at this. All right? Walking, the way that you live your life in the council, council has to do with the way of thinking. This is not anything devious. Okay, this is just the way you live your life. The way you live your life according to common sense, according to the way of the world. It's nothing blatantly wrong. Uh, the wicked here, wicked means godless, ungodly. Okay, so I'm just gonna maybe clarify here. We got ungodly or godless. It's not that they're actively rebelling against God. It's not that they are demon worshipers. They just don't have God in their lives. God isn't a part of their perspective 
at all. Um, it, it, and, and they may even say that he is, but they don't live like it because um, get, this is the way of life. And counsel is way of thinking. Kind of combine those there, I thought. But um, this is just this is just living your life the way that people live your life. It's passive. It's I'm not really thinking about God. I'm thinking you know this is reality. This is common sense. Uh, it's just how it is. Okay, this is just how you live. This is why. This is what you do. There's, there's no, uh, there's, there's nothing more or less than that. This is just common life, passive living. The problem is, there's a progression that we see, because you can only walk this way so long before we kind of step down. All right, and that's the next thing, which is standing. Now, what's the difference? between walking and standing. Walking is you're kind of moving in a certain direction. You, you, when you're standing, you stopped walking, right? Okay. Uh, this is a little bit more intentional. Walking is just, this is just the way I live. Standing is, hmm, what's going on around here? Right? Kind of looking around, listening. Paying attention, starting to notice, okay? And it's standing in the way of sinners. Okay, so standing is more intentional. Now, the way of sinners is where they are found. You're crossing paths, and, and you're, you're moving, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, wait, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to look around. You know what? This is where all the sinners are. Let me stop here. That's not just living your life. That's the way of sinners. The sinners, meaning people who are actively sinning. What's the difference between being godless and actively sinning? Anybody know? Yeah. Godless Active. person is just somebody who just lives life and not really thinking about it. Somebody who's actively sinning is actively they sinning. Know they're doing they, 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 they know what they're doing. They've got patterns and they just follow them. Okay. And so what we see here is a progression. It goes from ungodly to actively sinning. There's a progression here, right? There's a progression from this is just a way of thought to this is where they are. It's kind of directional. Like, you know, it's getting... I'm not just kind of around it. Now I'm going to where they are. That's a little bit different, isn't it? So the progression doesn't just go across. It goes down here. Um, and it goes from walking to standing. I'm more intentional. I'm looking around. And then we get to the, the third part, which is you go from walking to standing to sitting. What is sitting? What, what, kind, of, what kind of sitting is like um, get comfortable, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to join in. I'm going to identify with. This is this is this is this is who I am. This is my these are my people. This is my life. I, I'm going from just kind of walking in this general direction to stopping, looking around, and then I'm going to sit down and get comfortable. But the progression doesn't stop here. It's also over here. We go from way of, way of life and we thought to go into where they are, to, uh, or where they're found, I should say. That's a little bit different. Um, stopping where they are, to going to, purposefully going to where they are, which is the seat here, okay? So this is, I'm kind of crossing paths and noticing and paying attention. This is intentionally seeking them out, okay? I'm going to find out where they are, and I'm going to go there, and I'm going to get comfy. I'm going to intentionally seek, purposefully seek where sinners are. Except it's not just sinners. It goes from wicked to sinners to scoffers or mockers. Okay? What does this version say here? Um, it says mockers. Same thing, but um, what it means is people who hate God.
who hate God. So I go from living my way of life with the world around me, kind of directionless, kind of godless, but no big issues. But that progresses. Until suddenly, you can so quickly find yourself from here to here. Just no God in my life to hate God. And it happens just like that. It goes from well, you know what? This is just how it has to be because this is the way life is and you can't you can't get around that. So, you know, what's the big deal if I just hang around maybe a little or I can go to the bar and not drink kind of stuff that goes on in your head, okay? This would be a, this is just the way it is. This is, I'm going to go there and hang out, but I'll be okay. I won't join in to, I'm going there and I know exactly what I'm going to do and it's going to be bad and I'm going to enjoy it. And it never happens accidentally in the way that we tend to like to think it will. It happens accidentally because we're not paying attention to the way we live our life and the way that we think and what we're listening to. Because that's all this top line is. It always is just comes right back to the way you're living your life. The basic decisions that you make, things that you listen to, and the thought processes you use. When you when you're using terms like reality, common sense way it has to be, the way of the world, you have to do it this way, everybody does it this way, what's the big deal? You're setting yourself up to run down this progression. It says you're blessed if you don't do this. The alternative is in verse 2. It says, instead, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. We want to prosper, right? We want to be like that, that second part. How do we do that? What's the antidote in verse 2? Instead of, instead of just living passively through life, what does this person do? Psalm 1, verse 2. What does this person do? Meditate. Meditates on what? On his law. On his law. What's his law? The Bible. The Bible. God's Word. So instead of just kind of living aimlessly through life according to the way of the world, the person who prospers, the person who avoids trouble and sin and destruction, is the person who makes a priority of the Word of God. That's the direct contrast. Because if you don't choose and actively continue to choose God's Word, this is what happens passively. This is what's going to keep happening. This is the cycle. You can't avoid it. The alternative is to stop and go a completely different direction. No more what's wrong with it. Now what's right with it. No more what can I get away with, but how close can I get to God? How can I move forward in my life? No more this is just common sense. Now it's what does God want me to do here, even if it doesn't make sense? Even if it requires faith? Even if it means I'm out of my comfort zone? Even if it's hard? I'm going to do it anyway because I don't want to just do what I've always done or what everybody around me has always done. I want to do what God wants me to do, and there's a very big difference. But it starts with a very, 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 very small thing, and that is the lies that you listen to and the things that you think about. You cannot express to you enough the importance of what you think about. The common thread through every class that we're going to have is what you think about because what you think affects how you feel, and then how you act. It's kind of like this here. Listening to and dwelling, this is the thought. And then believing, it gets in you emotionally, and that's usually when we act, right? And so there's kind of this head, heart, hands kind of thing, or, or it's the T principle that we're going to use more next week, and uh, it has to do with thoughts, emotions, actions. And, and so what we think about is so important. And the first lie we have to overcome is the lie that what we think about isn't important. <laughs> Because it is. And it's the little things, the little choices that in and of themselves may not be directly sinful or not. Those are the most important choices. There are no harmless lies. There are no harmless decisions, really. So much of it has the power to set you in one direction or the other. To set you in a godless, I'm going to live life my way and not really think about God kind of life. Or to set you in the direction of, 
a, a relationship with God that causes everything that you do to prosper. And that's what we want to have. We want freedom. We want all of that. So we've got to be willing to do what it takes to get it, which means that delayed gratification, so it's really worse before we get better, and that connection to the Word of God. Now, the, the, this is all of this fits into that category of what we listen to, okay? But dwelling is part of this. It, it, they're very close together. Because once you listen to something, you start dwelling in, on it. That's what all of this is kind of playing out, right? Dwelling, mulling it over in your head. It's, um, it's this idea of engaging the enemy in conversation, okay? Do you know why we start thinking about doing something? Because we want to do it. We're really just looking for a reason to justify doing what we know we shouldn't do. And the more we think about it, the easier it is to justify, right? And so the more you think about it, guess what? The less chance you're going to do the right thing. So you know what the Bible says in Corinthians? We are, or is it, oh, I shouldn't have said the passage because I could be wrong. Right out of my head. I know what the verse says. Verse says we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So you know what that means? We may fall into the trap of hearing the wrong thing, but we're not going to dwell on it unless it's obedient to Christ. How do we know it's obedient to Christ? Well, we can start with that Philippians 4 passage that we talked about earlier, right? Is this obedient to Christ? Is this thought obedient to Christ? And if it's not, I'm going to reject it and I'm not going to dwell on it because as soon as I dwell on it, I'm engaging the enemy conversation. I'm weighing the, the benefits. Uh, the pros and the cons, and, and where is this going to take me, and is this what I want? And as soon as you start down that road, the battle is really lost. It really is, because you, you're already getting emotionally invested in what you want to happen, and you're just looking for the technicality to justify doing what you know God doesn't want you to do. So it's too late. Reject it. Don't let that temptation linger. Get rid of that. Dwell on the truth instead. Because once you dwell on it enough, you're going to believe it. You can only hear something and tell yourself something so long before you believe it. People can only tell you something so long before you believe it. And it gets down in you. And then it becomes an emotional part of you. And once your emotions are involved, all bets are off, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they call you crazy. Mm -hmm. To your, you know you're crazy. Believe? Believe? Once you expect to believe that you is crazy. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's so crazy. She crazy. She ain't got good sense. That's what that is. Yep. And then after a while, in, in your mind, you can believe that you is crazy. Yep. Because the things that be happening to you. Yeah. And the problem with believing it is that once you believe something, it is inevitable that you will act on it. Yes, you okay? will. Okay? Because the whole, the whole point of belief is action. If you believe it, you act on it. If, if I believe that if I am going to get in my car, I can to turn the ignition and it's going to start. Right. Then am I going to try to walk home? No. No, I'm going to get my car, turn no, the key in the ignition, and drive the, home. The okay? best thing to do is that when you really talk like that, you don't listen. Right. You reject it. Is this, reject, reject is this something that's obedient to say. Christ? Is this something to dwell on? Walk away. Don't say nothing. When you believe something, you act on it. Yeah. So you have to be very careful about what you believe. How do you choose what you believe? Well, if you're not paying attention, this is how you've chosen what you're going to believe. Yep, Passively. Yep. Culturally. This is how it's yeah. always been. This is what everybody else does. This is the way of the world. We can't do that anymore. We're going to talk more on Tuesday about specifically how to kind of dig up what's already deep down inside right. and replace it with the truth. But moving forward, it's got to come back to, I'm not going to dwell on things that aren't true, that, that don't honor God and aren't obedient to Christ. Because I have got to believe the right things. Because if, I, if, if you want to know, here, here's, here's what happens, okay? Belief always results, that or always produces behavior, okay? So, believing a lie produces sinful behavior. Yes, it does. And sinful behavior results in bondage. How do you get stuck? It starts with believing a lie. Mm -hmm. that, that lie that you think about and that you begin to believe causes you to act in a sinful way. And mm -hmm. we're going to look at that as we look at these different lies and how that plays out. And then the, once you sin, that sin takes hold and you mm -hmm. end up in bondage. That's what happened with David, right? That's what happened with, with, with Eve. Mm -hmm. And so 
the alternative would be, instead of believing the lie, I believe the truth. Now, if I believe the truth, instead of acting sinfully, what am I going to do action-wise? I'm going to act in obedience, obedience to God, and then the opposite of bondage would be freedom. That's what we want, right? Yeah. So, so how do we end up in bondage? Well, sinful behavior. How do we end up in sinful behavior? Believing a lie. Yeah. Okay. So, if I want to, if I want to have freedom, I got to be obedient to God. Yeah. And if I'm going to be obedient to God, I got to believe the truth. <laughs> so I need to know the truth. The lies are all around me. Lies come easy. Yeah. I need to find out what the truth is. And I need to figure out how to live it and be obedient so that I can experience that freedom. That's what these 40 lies we're going to study, which we, we're going to start on Thursday. Okay, so we have one week left. We've got one more class Tuesday that is more of the laying the groundwork here. But then we're going to dig in with that first lie, and you're going to kind of see all of this come together. It's going to be really cool. Uh, but there, there's one other thing here that I want to point out, and that is the fact that you can't believe a lie and the truth at the same time. Okay? No matter how hard you try, you can't. The lie corrupts the truth, okay? So when you do believe a lie, when you accept a lie, you are rejecting the truth. And this is really important because sometimes we think that, that we're, we're managing both, but it, it's not. And so we often fall because we think, well, I'm believing the truth over here, but there's just this one little lie. But that one little lie is going to corrupt any element of truth in your life. Because once you believe a lie, your mind gets so consumed with believing that lie and acting sinfully yep. that it muddies the water so bad you can't see the truth anymore. It was, so there's this pattern where it gets easier and easier to believe lies because the truth is now kind of off in the distance. And, and all it takes is that one thing. Look, with David, the first thing wasn't even necessarily a sin. It was just a not smart decision. It was just a culturally relevant decision, maybe, but not a smart decision, not a godly decision. It was a godless decision, okay? But then, one sin led to another sin, led to another sin, led to another sin. Where did that come from? One lie led to another lie, led to another lie. What's the first lie? Well, it's okay to look. What's the second lie? Well, her husband's not even home, and hey, I'm the king, I deserve to have fun. What's the next lie? I can fix this. What's the next lie? can't fix this, but I can fix it this way. What's the next slide? Nobody's going to find out. And these are just the lies that immediately pop into my head. I can only imagine all the little lies that kind of support those bigger lies, because there's always more than one lie. And so this pattern of it's easier and easier each time, because that's why it's a slippery slope, because once you start, you can't really backtrack very easily. But you know what? The flip side it's a lot harder to believe the truth at the beginning. I'm kind of climbing up that slippery slope. But I'll tell you what. You get over those initial hurdles of believing the truth and doing those hard things and rejecting those lies, and it gets easier and easier to believe the truth. The more you meditate on God's Word and the more you know God's Word, the easier it is to understand God's Word. You've got to set some things in motion. And you got to start pursuing God. And the more you pursue God, the easier it becomes to pursue God. But if you wait until it feels easy or good to do those things, you'll never do them. Because the things that feel easy and good are the things that got us into trouble because that's how the devil gets us to believe the lies. So the alternative here is I'm going to do the hard thing up front because I want to get better, not feel better. I eventually want to feel better. But I want to start with getting better. And so I'm going to do these hard things. Even though I don't feel like it, I'm going to do what's right regardless of how I feel, because it's what's right. I know the end result. I'm denying my flesh, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to read God's Word. I'm going to memorize God's Word, and I'm going to do the right thing, even though it doesn't feel right. And then, you know what? The next day, it's a little bit easier. And the next day, it's a little bit easier. Next thing you know, six months have gone down, and now it's a pattern, it's a habit, and it has become so much easier for you to make changes in your life because you have opened yourself up to God, and you've got to start somewhere. So start now. Mm -hmm. Seeking God's word, meditating on his truth, so that you can experience freedom. So, any questions about any of this? You guys excited? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Me too. Every Tuesday and Thursday. Good. All right. Yeah.
here, here are some of the main points you need to have written down that could show up on your test. Or, by the way, let me just let you know this is a really cool spiritual principle, okay? You know how when you're in school, or in my fly, when you have a class, there are tests to test your progress and what you're learning and understanding, right? God does the same thing. When you learn something, when God teaches you something, whether that's through a class, through your personal devotions, through a counselor, through a book you read, whatever it is, when God teaches you something, he tests you on it, okay? Which means if we're doing all this, all these classes about little decisions and what's right with it versus what's wrong with it and getting better versus feeling better and doing what's right regardless of how you feel, expect that very soon you may find yourself in a position to have to act on those things because God's going to test you. You just had all this training on the importance of asking the right questions and going the right direction. So now he's going to give you a choice. Are you going to choose what's wrong with it or are you going to choose what's right with it? Sometimes the test comes before the lesson. Not often, but sometimes. And sometimes you'll be in a class and you'll be like, wow, I totally just did that and totally just failed. <laughs> now I know next time what to do, but there will be a next time. And so prepare yourself because this is not just a textbook thing. This is not just a checking off a list or doing my worksheets. This is life. This is real life, living it out. And so there are going to be real life tests where God just kind of throws you into the thick of it and says, okay, pass, fail, here we go. Ready? Buckle up be afraid of it. It's a good thing because the more that God is testing you and giving you opportunities to show what you've learned, the quicker you're going to progress in that relationship with him and the quicker you can begin to overcome these problems in your life. So, excited? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Listening to things that aren't true is the first step towards bondage, okay? So, so this is this is the big thing I want you to make sure you, you remember, all right? Belief produces behavior. Moving forward in this study, there are going to be things that we talk about that you, your first reaction is probably going to be something like, I don't believe that. I would never believe that. And I'm going to say, stop. <laughs> and I want you to look at what you do. Because what you do proves what you believe. Just because you didn't mean to believe it. Just because you don't want to believe it doesn't mean that you don't believe it. We're going to be looking at actions and behavior, not what we want to believe. Because we all want to believe the right things. We all want to do the right things. But we're not doing them. That's why we've got to get real, brutally honest, about what we really are doing so that we can trace what we're believing to be able to root out the lies and place them the truth. You need to know the progression here. Listen, dwell, believe, and act. We're going to talk about that fairly often. this progression of believing a lie believing a lie results in sinful behavior, results in bondage okay, that's that progression so believe a lie is what? Belie believing a lie produces sinful behavior oh which produces bondage so it's, if I believe a lie I'm going to act I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act sinfully and if I act sinfully I'm going to end up bondage okay and we need to know how that works so that we can figure out well if I'm feeling like I'm in bondage if I feel stuck and overwhelmed and like I'm enslaved I need to I need to know okay well maybe there's some sinful behavior in my life maybe there's a lie I'm believing that I need to figure out here because I, God didn't say that he was gonna set me free and then leave me like this that's not how he works I just need to be free so the alternative there is believing the truth which results in obedience, which results in freedom. Okay? So belief in the lie equals simple behavior equals bondage. Belief in the truth equals righteous behavior equals freedom. And every area of bondage in your life can be traced back to a lie. Every single one of them. 
There's not one area in your life of bondage of sin, uh, 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 a bondage of pain and suffering that, that, that you feel stuck in, and ruts that you've been mm -hmm. overcome by, and holes that you've fallen in. It can't be traced back to a lie somewhere. Little or big, it always comes back to a lie. Instead, we've got to know the truth. So, on Tuesday, lesson five, this will be the, the final lesson of the, of the introduction, claiming the truth. How do we take all of this mess that we just uncovered with the lies and the bondage and then how we get there, and how do we get rid of it so that we have the truth in us so that we're actually walking in freedom? What's the process that we use for change? Okay, So this is the process, process that we, we use to get into trouble. What's the process to get out of trouble? I don't think I, I forgot to get those. Uh, Pam, did you have to pull this off the printer? All right, I'll get one for you. They're, they're on the printer. They just got to be hole punched. So you can get those and get those available. So if you have questions, then uh, go ahead and pray for us. All right, let's pray. Dearly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would help everyone here to get excited about the opportunity to begin to identify these areas of bondage in their lives and then uh, be able to, to know your truth and to be able to be set free by you as we choose to believe your truth, to know your truth, and to love your truth. I pray that you'd help us to take extra care and caution in our lives, to be aware of the direction that we're going, the things that we're listening to, and, and the, the way that we 